All right. Well, welcome everybody. If you're watching this on the recording or whether you're here live, um, I'm excited to do this. I have not done very many of these, but one of the reasons I wanted to start this Telegram group was just because I wanted to do more sort of like hip pocket trainings, stuff that didn't require a ton of buildup and there wasn't this huge webinar process that I had to take everybody through. Just people who kind of already knew who I was and what we were doing and who just wanted to go kind of one level deeper other than just getting some emails from me um, and maybe joining a program or something that I've got. And so I'm trying to take concepts as they're coming up in some of the other coaching that I'm doing and then giving you guys some insights into what I'm teaching. And this is, there is a, I'm, I, this is a shamelessly self-serving on my part, because ultimately what I hope is that if you attend enough of these free trainings and you start to learn enough and you start to see a little bit behind the curtain, that it'll be something that you're interested in joining and maybe coming over and, and working with me. And so um, that said, there's no high pressure sales stuff in any of this. If you end up seeing what you uh, watching the training today and, and you want to talk to me about maybe working together, just send me a direct message here on Telegram and I'll send you a link. We'll set up a time for a quick call. But we want to talk today about four questions that all of your prospects are going to ask before they make the decision to buy. So if we're thinking about this in the context of, uh, of where your, your prospect is, the potential client is, is that they already have some sort of, they're already aware that you exist and they're aware that you have something to offer them. And when we talk about offers, if I just come in here and let's do this, let's just start like this. I'll erase this to begin with. When we start talking about the, um, the offer that we make. The offer consists of a few things, okay? First is the promise. So what is the outcome that is being offered? And when I was just talking with Ben's here before we got started, he offers nutritional advice, stuff like that. Um, and so inside of that is probably some sort of uh, a transformational change that's going to occur. Like uh, maybe you have eczema and you're going to help with that, or maybe you have you know uh, severe inflammation and we're going to help with that. But what is the promise that's being offered? After we come and work together, you are, you are going to have X, Y, and Z, or you're not going to have X, Y, and Z, right? So it could be a, um, a reduction in something rather than just a gain. But that's the first thing that we have inside the offer. The second thing that we have is the actual program or product, if that's what you're selling, that you have to offer. So you're making a big promise and saying, this is what I can do for you, and this is what, if we work together, we can accomplish together. And the second in the program is, okay, here's the steps, and here's how we're going to do that. So the promise is really the emotional anchor, and then getting them excited about envisioning the transformation and arriving at some point in time where the pain or problem that they're currently experiencing doesn't exist anymore. And then the program are kind of the detailed steps involved. Because anytime that you present somebody with a, a really grand idea and you, you tell them, hey, we're gonna fix what's broken, unless you're dealing with a very immature audience, and I don't mean immature in the sense of young and naive, I'm just talking about in terms of the market itself hasn't seen this type of offer anymore, uh, very often. Um, you're gonna have to do a little bit of convincing. You're gonna provide them a little bit of logic. And especially in the coaching and consulting business, um, anytime we're dealing with clients, there's a pretty good chance that they've already bought something from somebody else, probably multiple things from other people, and they've already heard big promises being made. And we have to be able to show them something that is unique or different that they haven't seen before that gives them the confidence that, okay, this time, if I make the decision uh, to go and be coached or get some consulting from this person, that I'm actually going to get the result. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So when we talk about the program, too many people try and put the program as the front and center. Here's how many videos you're going to get. And here's the training that we're going to receive. And here's the exercise program that you're going to get or the advice I'm going to offer you. Um, and they ignore the promise. And so promise always comes first. Then we've got the program or the product. And then last but not least is the proposition. And the proposition are the actual terms that someone is going to go through, that someone is going to have to agree to in order to work with you. So one might be, what does it cost, right? That's a term. How much time do I need to commit to this? That would be another one. Uh, how much change is it going to require to my life or my lifestyle, right? So that proposition, uh, what are the bonuses that are included? What are the other stuff I get on top of what you've talked about? That all goes into the proposition. 
So we start anytime we're creating an offer. And I just got done working with um, my collective clients. And those are the clients who are starting from scratch, building their coaching businesses from zero to, I kind of draw the line right around $100,000 a year because that's kind of where your needs and your kind of struggles change. Um, but they're in that kind of that beginning stage and they're starting to write their first offer. And I'm taking them through the offer template and document that I use in order to sell, you know, all the way up to $10,000 coaching programs right now. And we got a specific way of taking them through that. But the reason that we do it the way we do it is because it's so important that we get the promise right and we have the justification with the product and the logic and that the proposition that we're making to them, that the, the value that they're getting outweighs what they're going to, what they're going to have to put up in order to get that outcome. And that's where we get to these four questions. And so I apologize for wanting to kind of, I just need to set the stage a little bit before we start talking about these four questions. So you know the context in which the client is coming to you, or the prospect's coming to you. So they already know about you. They already know about the offer that you've made to them. And now they're going to ask four questions before they make any decision or before they choose to buy or not buy in many cases. Okay, so what are those four questions? Okay, the first one is what is required? Okay, so you can think about this in terms of cost, but it's not always cost. Cost is what everybody goes to, but cost is just a small piece of it. It could also be um, if I'm financial cost, I guess. What, is, what do I have to pay? It's also, you know, how many hours do I have to commit to this? Or, or, or am I going to have to, if you're, if you're doing diet and nutrition, like am I going to have to go to the gym two hours a day? Because I don't like doing that. That's an extra cost. If it costs me that to go and get the result, then I don't want to do that. If I say in my business, when I work with folks, one of the things that I really hate is, one of the biggest things that I hate is improper expectations. And so I set right from the very beginning, if you're starting a new coaching business, you can expect to work 18 to 24 months before you start seeing any real money come out of the business. And while we can technically build the entire business from a, you know, the lead engine to a way to nurture your clients all the way to selling them your product and delivering it, we can do that in about six months. But you need to be prepared that there is going to be effort and, and more work that is required for you to get the business to a point where you can actually we're actually making money off of it and you have a legitimate chance of maybe taking that business full time. And so I require a six month commitment up front because I don't want to work with anybody who's not willing to make that commitment. I don't want people coming in and thinking they're going to have their coaching business setting up and making money in 90 days. That's what everybody else will tell them. But it's not a good thing to do for my clients because they're going to be angry with me and they're going to feel cheated and they didn't get the result that I promised them. And so what are the costs that are involved? Because they're going, to make a, they're going to make a judgment call as to whether or not it's worth it based on that. The second one is what is the likelihood of success? And we would refer to this as the, the, as the uh, belief. Okay? And this one gets overlooked a lot when we start talking about likelihood of success is because as I said, if they've come through trainings before, they've been part of trainings that you've done already, uh, there's a good chance that they have tried and failed many times. Um, I always use the example because fitness is easy because everybody kind of has got it. You're either too skinny or too fat. You either want to look, have more muscle or you want to have less belly fat. It's kind of, everybody gets it. Um, I looked at like P90X. There are you know, some of these uh, really hardcore fitness programs that you would go through and, uh, and you would look at the people who would get the results and they, they have incredible results, incredible testimonials of people who went in and lost a hundred pounds and now they're in the best shape of their lives. And then you look at the program itself and what is required in terms of the cost, time, effort, energy. And when I look at that, I say to myself, I'm a hundred percent certain that if I bought this program, and I did it every single day, and I followed the nutrition program the way that it's, it's outlined here, that I would end up being one of those success stories. Here's the problem. I know I won't do that. I know I'm not going to go and do the hour-long training every day and adjust the nutrition to the point where I'm going to be able to look like the guy in the advertisement. And so when we talk about the likelihood of success, it's not just their faith in you, 
but also it's a faith in themselves. Like what, and if this is a problem in your industry, if it's something that you sell that requires a lot of work, which in many cases, coaching and consulting, consulting not as much, but coaching specifically requires a lot of work by the end user, by the person who's hiring the coach. And if they're looking at everything they're going to have to do, and they're saying to themselves, I am not going to be able to do that, then inside of your offer, you have to overcome that in the languaging that you're using. You have to be able to explain to them, hey, I, it probably feels like you're not going to be able to do this. This seems like it's a lot. But in reality, it's not really as much as it looks like. It could be you could say something to the effect of, but we've created some systems or some processes. We've done some of the heavy lifting for you so that you, it ensures you're going to get the result when maybe you haven't before. But if you're not answering that, that, third, that second question of what is the likelihood of success, in their mind, they have to believe that there's a high likelihood that they're going to succeed at this. Otherwise, what? They're setting their money on fire, right? So we got to be able to answer that question as well. Then the third question, okay, is what is the worst that could happen? Sorry, my handwriting is terrible. Okay. This is what we refer to as risk, right? Now, when it comes to risk, what's the worst that could happen? Let me give you an example of this. Let's say that you are fighting cancer. And there is actually a, uh, there is a protocol right now for cancer called the Gershwin method. It's been around a very long time. And what it requires is basically for you to drink almost nothing but carrot juice every day. And you drink it like six or eight times a day. And then they mix it in with some other juices, but it's an all liquid diet. And they've got some incredible results that they've been able to get for people who are suffering from specific types of cancers. Um, but that's a really big risk. Okay. So it's not just, if I'm going to go with the Gershwin method rather than going and getting chemotherapy and what the modern medicine would tell me to go do, if I choose to ignore that and not do that and use this Gershwin method instead, it's not a, a financial cost. That's the real risk. Cause if I fail, I die, right? It's not the risk in, oh, I've got to adjust my lifestyle or the cost of having to adjust my lifestyle. That's the really big concern there. It's not that I have to try and now stomach doing nothing but drinking carrot juice all day, every day, right? That's not really the risk or the costs that are involved. What's the biggest cost or risk to them? The risk is I do this, I choose A instead of B and I die. And, and the one that I choose is the wrong method. And the other one might've worked, but this one sure didn't. And now my life is over. That's a massive risk that people are taking. And it's one that we don't common associate with building out risk insight. So people think in terms of time risk, money risk, that kind of stuff. But we don't think of this in terms of, hey, what is the really big cost of doing this? I'll give you another example that's a little closer to home for my business. So I have two sides of my business. First side is people who are generating less than $100,000 a year in their coaching business. I consider those to be kind of beginners, regardless of how long you've been doing it. And then there's everybody who's doing kind of more than that. And in the more than that category, one of the things that I pitch to my clients and one of the reasons that people come to me is they've got a business that kind of owns them. They're stuck on this launch process where they're constantly having to go and create new funnels and new offers and new coaching programs and stuff to sell in order to kind of keep the business going. And it's frustrating. They have clients that really good clients who are coming in and, and doing business with them that are happy with the results and then they leave. And now we either got to find something new to sell to those people or we got to find a way to convince them to like keep going and to re-up and to continue to do business with us. And so what I tell them is, is I can show you a way to restructure the coaching business to create what I call forever clients, where you can charge a premium for what you do. The clients come in and we create a way for you to have a relationship that doesn't actually end. As long as both of you are getting benefit from it, it's going to continue in, in forever if, that, if the client, if both you and the client want that to happen. And in doing that, we also create a way for you to get the really great results for your clients and then not have to create anything new to sell to the rest of your list who aren't yet clients of yours. It's a, it's a very unique way of running a coaching business, right? Now, the problem with this is if I've got somebody who's making $250,000, half a million dollars, a million dollars in their coaching business, and they're frustrated and they come to me 
and I say, hey, here's what I think we should do. I think we should re-engineer your business to look more like this rather than what you currently have. It's not just the work in re-engineering the business. It's definitely not the cost of working with me. The biggest risk to them is I have a million dollar business. What happens if I follow Jason's advice and it doesn't work? I could blow up a million dollar business. I could blow up in, in many cases a $300,000 a year salary that I'm pulling out of this business. I could blow that up because I listened to his advice and shifted my business strategy. Okay, So that's one of those things. What is the cost? What is the risk that it involves? You need to know what is the worst that could happen. Human beings are, are more concerned with avoiding catastrophic loss than they are of seeking gain. This is one of the reasons that people tend to go to the same restaurants over and over again. They don't, they're not out trying new restaurants every single time they go. They got their restaurant. They know what's on the menu. They know it might not be the best food in the world, but food's going to be pretty good. There are other people who regularly vacation who go to the same vacation spots every time they go on vacation. Why is that? Because it's not because that's the greatest place in the world. There's probably lots of places that are better and maybe even more affordable. But they know I got two weeks or I got a week of vacation time and I want to make sure that the experience that we have as a family is going to be good so we go back to the same place over and over again. Okay, That is a, that is a desire to avoid catastrophic loss. And your clients, before they buy anything, are asking that question, not just what are the risks, but what is the worst that could happen? Okay. And then last but not least, four, is it worth it? Call that benefit. Okay. So when it's all said and done, when I add up the costs, the likelihood that I'm going to be successful, the risk of what is the worst that could happen if things go horribly wrong, then we make a decision as to whether or not what we're doing, it, the, the transaction between the two of us is worth it or not. But I put together this little training, this little kind of graph here to illustrate what I'm talking about. So on the left, we've got benefits. On the right, we've got costs. And when we're talking about um, on the left here, this is what we would call this section here. This is our promise. Okay. These are the, all the benefits that we're promising to the prospect when they buy from us. What is the time, money, effort, resources that you're going to have available, reputation, and health? Because these are things that people don't talk about a lot, are resources, okay, reputation, and health usually only if you're in the health niche do people consider this. But, you know, what emotionally, right? If you, if I can, if I can get you to a point where you can work two or three hours a day on your business and that business generates you two or $300,000 a year in income, and it gives you a lot of free time and it gives you stability of cash flow so that you're not stressing every month about where the money is going to come from. What do you think that does to your health, to your anxiety levels, to your ability to focus and, and enjoy life? One of the things that doesn't get talked about enough as entrepreneurs is that as we start to become more successful, you would think that anxiety would go down. But normally, as success increases, so does cost, um, so does responsibility. And what ends up happening is entrepreneurs have a really hard time laying work down and going and enjoying the rest of their life. They have a tough time being present in any situation. And, and these are common things that occur with as stress and emotional issues. Health ends up suffering. They end up drinking too much. All of that stuff happens because they haven't addressed the health They've just focused on the money. And so when we're talking about the potential benefits that someone is getting from us, it includes all of these things. And then on the other side, on the cost, this is, of course, you know, the proposition, right? So what is it going to cost me in order to get the result? And what we want in here is we want the benefits to so highly outweigh the cost that it becomes a no-brainer, right? So if I tell you that I can help you create, oh, let's just say, I can help you create $5,000 in the next 30 days by getting you, you know, 10 new clients, okay? And I'll do it all for you. 
I'll put together the entire funnel. I'll do all the copy. I'll do everything for it. And I'll just give you this turnkey thing. And it's going to cost you five grand. Okay. Now, it's not costing you any money, or it's costing you money, but it's not costing you any time, not a lot of effort. You're going to have a ton of resources that you're going to get, right? Uh, reputation will likely increase because as financial su financial success increases and as notoriety increases, so does reputation. And you're going to increase the quality of your health, right? So there's very little in here. We don't have to worry about any of this stuff, right? The only thing that's costing us here is money. And assuming I can deliver on the promise, then you've got the whole process put together. You got the whole funnel put together. You should be able to then turn around and make this $5,000 again every single 30 days, right? So now you're doing the calculation in your mind and you're saying over the course of the next year, that's $60,000 and it only cost me five grand, right? I can further create some extra benefit in here by doing some things like this. Let's take that same scenario. I'll do all the work up front. You're standing to make 60K. You got to pay 5K, but I'll let you break up the payments over the course of the next 12 months, or you don't pay until you get your first five clients, right? See how we're starting to tip the scale, the balance from one side to the other? Now, again, we've got to balance this with the amount of risk. So again, the more work that the client has to do, the less likelihood it is that they're going to do it or that they're going to do it correctly. And so we've got to be careful that we don't offer them the world and do a ton of work up front and then don't end up getting paid on the back end. But the concept here is really important in answering those four questions. How do we shift the weight to the benefit side and away from the cost side? All right. And so when we think about this, we have measurable outcomes and then we kind of have binary outcomes because I get a lot of people who are like, well, I don't have like a financial return or a direct like sort of like money for money change, right? Where, oh, I'm going to spend $5,000, but I'm going to make 60000 And so there are both measurable outcomes and then there are binary outcomes. And then understand how your success is, how you're going to measure the success of the results that you're getting for people. So in brainstorming the promise, we understand now that the, the promise is really the important piece here. Once the promise is established and they understand the promise, the promise is big enough, then all we have to do is explain the steps and how we're going to get the, how they're going to get the result. It becomes a lot easier in the sales process. Okay. So when we talk about measurable outcomes here, we've got, oh, glad I start, I'm glad I started my recording. almost forgot. Um, we got money, right? Return on investment new leads, new clients or customers, like membership growth. These are all things that are directly tied to money. Then you've got time. How many hours can you save them? Um, reduce time to a result, right? So I'm going to cut down the amount of time it takes you to build out this funnels or build out this, this sales process or to convert a, a stranger into a customer. Um, how many more days off can you get? This is a big one for me in, in what we do with uh, my high-end coaching clients is just creating more white space on their calendars for them to do whatever they want. More free time, more new hires. And then when it comes to effort, hey, less work, fewer sessions, less energy and resources, fewer employees, less money. All of this stuff ties into less effort on the part of the person who's buying from you. Reputation, more exposure, higher status, more referrals. And then when it comes to health, as we talked about before, lower stress, blood, blood pressure goes down, weight goes down, mental state and acuity goes up, all of those things are really good. And those are all measurable, right? So when we make our offer to people, we make a big promise to them, we can show them that here's the measurable results that we're going to try and get for you. But if you happen to be in an industry where you cannot make a measurable result, there are also binary outcomes that you can offer to people. So for example, um, if you're helping people with dating, Someone is either single or they're married, right? If the goal is to get somebody married and find them a spouse, then if you're making that offer to people, there's no like measurable results because nobody wants to go on 50 dates for the sake of going on 50 dates, right? The goal is getting them married. 
So if we're teaching, if that's the offer that we're making to people, then part of the way we show them how we get there might be say, hey, we're going to put you on five high quality dates. And here are the exact criteria that we're going to use in order to make sure that you're matched with the perfect person and you have the highest likelihood of success. And we're going to continue to do that until and re reiterate and refine that process through the dates that you go on and the feedback that you give us until we match you with the perfect person for you, right? But ultimately, we're going to get you married. And the only measurable results we have or the only measurable processes is how we get you from single to married. Make sense? Okay. You have overweight to fit. You know, this is less of one. You can really create some measurable outcomes with that. Um, no YouTube channel versus having a YouTube channel, right? So there's, there's, it's really, it's a binary. It's like a light switch. It's on or off. You either do or you don't. Um, unfulfilled versus fulfilled. Again, if you're working in the, uh, in the, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Self-help space. And you're one of the, these, uh, what do you call them? Life coaches. Um, nothing to say bad about life coaches. It's just very nonspecific. But in terms of life coaching, if you have somebody who's coming to you who's very depressed, they're unhappy with their job, they're unhappy with their life, they're unhappy with their marriage, they're feeling very unfulfilled, that can be a binary outcome, is we're going to tr make that transition. And then inside of the product or the program that you offer to them, we explain the process for doing that so that they get the idea by the time they're done that, oh yeah, I can see a path to f going from where I am today, depressed, anxiety-stricken, unfulfilled, to really having a full and fulfilled life, okay? And then last one, no email sequence to email sequence. These are just some ideas to help you think through when you're making your promise, are you using measurable, measurable results or binary results? And then the last thing that you've got to consider inside of the, the, the promise that you're making in answering those four questions is how success is going to be measured. Is it going to be measured by a specific result? Is it going to be by a specific period of time? Are there going to be benchmarks that we're going to measure? Is it a binary outcome? Like the, we'll know we have the result when you have the YouTube channel built? Or is it using a, some sort of other measurable result that we have? Because so we have to be able to show this inside of the promise. We have to show them what is the measure, what is the result, the outcome that we can get, and then how are we going to measure that and then what are the process inside of building out the program? What are the steps involved with doing that? Does that make sense? So last thing I want to cover with you, and as I said before, these are really just designed to be very short hip pocket trainings to get the ideas flowing in your head, let you take some notes, go back and let it simmer, and, uh, and, and then start working through this stuff when you have the time, okay? But in clarifying the promise, I think it's helpful to list out a few different things. And I've got a, just an example in here. So you've got the top, you, on the left, you've got outcomes that they want. Okay. Here, let me get a green one, right? Outcomes that they want first. And in my case, let's, well, let's say, not necessarily in my case, but let's say your job is to help people get higher quality clients. That they're getting a ton of clients, really terrible clients, and you want to get them high quality clients. So the outcome they want are better clients. They want people who do the work and who get the result. What are the things that they hate, right? Well, they, in my case, they hate one-on-one -on -one calls, high pressure sales, some of that type of stuff. They don't want to be able to doing all that. That's out of alignment with who they are. And so what are the things they hate? Um, what are the things that they've tried? So I've tried doing webinars and I've tried product launches or paid ads and none of that stuff really works for me. Well, the truth is any one of those things will work, but if they, they've already tried it and they don't really enjoy that, it's not something that they want to do, then we need to know what that is too. And then we have an even if. So the even if is you can find success with this even if. So to give you a pitch, it would go something like this. Hey, do you want better clients without having to spend hours doing one-on-one -on -one calls or using high pressure sales tactics? Are you tired? Of, have you tried using webinars and product launches and paid ads without having success? Well, I wanna show you how you can generate X number of high quality uh, clients in the next five days, even if you suck at copywriting, right? Something along those lines. We're kinda gotta build a pitch and clarify that promise using this process. And so what I would have you do is take this and write it out. Just give yourself the headlines here and this write out, what do they want? They want better clients. They want more clients. Okay. They want to work less. 
They want less stress. They want predictable income. This is just in my business. So these are all things that people want who come to work with me, right? So, and then we come down the line. Okay, they want more clients, but they don't want, again, it might be the same thing. They don't want to do one-on-one -on -one calls um, and things they've tried before that well, they've tried, uh, let's say they've tried um, lead magnets. Okay. And in this case, we might say something, do you want more clients, but you don't want to spend a ton of time on one-on-one -on -one calls, but you've tried a lead magnet to put people into your email list and that hasn't worked? Well, let me show you a new way of building a lead magnet that will allow you to do that even if you've tried and failed. Okay, something like that. And this is how we build a promise. This is how we build an offer. And ultimately, it's how we answer these four questions. What is required in the cost? How do we drive down the perceived cost of what we have to offer? How do we increase in the prospect's mind the likelihood that they are going to get the result that they want? How do we identify what the worst thing that could happen to them is and then overcome that? or at least mitigate it as best we can. In many cases, you can't eliminate it, but you can mitigate it. And then the last, not but not least, leave them with the question when they are ask, asking this final question that is so heavily weighted in favor of the benefits that they say, I would have to be an idiot not to take this deal. And ultimately, if you can get your prospects to a place where they're looking at your offer and they're going through those four questions and when they get down to question four, they go, man, this deal is too good to pass up. I would have to be an idiot not to take this. Or this is, in my, when I write the sales copy, I'll say, this is a no-brainer offer for you. And the idea is the offer is so good, it just makes too much sense not to do it. Right? That's the way we want to have it play out. And so go back into your offer as you're putting together, if you're putting together your first offer, start thinking through these questions. If you're putting your product together and you're starting to think of what is the result that I'm going to try and get for this prospect, how do we get that result as high as possible? And one of the best ways that you can, there's the best exercises you can do to run through this is ask yourself, I don't know, what was that? Um, ask yourself the question, um, what if money was no obstacle? So I was thinking about charging $500 for this program, but what if I charged $5,000 or $50,000? What could I do if I didn't put a ceiling or a max on what I charged the client how big could I make the outcome? How big could I make the promise? And oftentimes what you'll find with that is that it makes a lot of sense to go from a $500 offer to a $15,000 offer. But you can do a lot more and do a lot more work with the client for the client at those higher price points, which in the end is going to create a better offer for the right person. And then it's just a matter of going out and finding those people. And I got to tell you right now, there are plenty of people out there who will pay $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 for coaching and consulting work, as long as the outcome that you can deliver is big enough, right? So what questions do you guys have before I let you all go?